we, co we cover a lot of historical topics and a wide variety of time frames in our history talk series. Uh, we have the uh, Native Americans, the early pioneer history of Tumwater. Uh, we have World War I we've uh, talked about this season, uh, women's history, Olympia Brewing Company talk, uh, the Capitol building. We had the Northwest Carriage Museum from Raymond here. We had Lewis and Clark at Fort Clatsop. That was a great one. And a lot more going on. So we cover a lot of eras and a lot of uh, events historically. But one part of our local history we haven't covered that much is local history that occurred in our lifetime, uh, the 1960s to the present. And so that's what's going to happen today. And we do that with a, uh, a woman who's lived it as an active, <laughs> active part of our Thurston County area communities. For 51 years, Karen Frazier has taken an active role in service and development of our local culture. Uh, 43 of those years were as an elected official, and she had a long list. Of, uh, well, city council of Lacey and then mayor of Lacey, uh, Thurston County commissioner, state representative, and finally state senator. And now, what, mom and... Retired. Retired, okay, there we go. Uh, she knows many people and many people know her. And she's familiar with public speaking and podiums and microphones and things like that, so she's good at that. But this is a, a first for her because uh, she's gonna be running a PowerPoint picture presentation, which she's never done before. But I, I'm so proud of her because she took the uh, technical bull by the horns and learned how to do a PowerPoint herself, putting it all together herself. So, <laughs> well, wait till she's finished. Maybe she didn't do a good, well, no, she didn't. <laughs> all right, I, I should, by the way, let's uh, pass this around too. Uh, sign in, if you haven't gotten on our email list, we'd love to have you put that on here and just let us know you're here. So we'll pass this back row to row, all the way to the back if we start. Attendance, yeah. And if you're already on our mailing list, you don't, you don't have to put your email address on. But especially if you're first-timers, that's good to have that information for us. Now, let's have a warm welcome. <laughs> a warm Schmidt House welcome for Karen Fraser. Well, good afternoon. What a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for inviting me and today to provide a bit of a sketch of the history of our local area as I have lived it. And it's uh, so then, from then till now, then was January 1967 when I arrived. And now, of course, we're all here in the middle of 2018. So that's 51 years in 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be a sketch and headlines, and we're gonna kind of power through quite a bit of, of pictures here. So, uh, as in, the, in Shakespeare's play Macbeth, in one of the opening scenes, he has Macbeth uh, muse as he's thinking about his future. Uh, who can look into the seeds of time and tell which grains will grow and which will not? And uh, so since 1967, a lot of grains have grown, some have not. Uh, some have come and gone, and some have remained dormant. So uh, I've made a selection, and everything I'm talking about, I could give you vast more detail about, and a huge amount I've left out. So I'm uh, 51 years and 45 minutes is quite a challenge. So anyway, uh, let's see here. Yes, so here's what brought me to Olympia. This is a state capitol campus in 1966. I arrived on Friday, January 5, a few days before the session was going to start on Monday, and, uh, and I would start work with the State House of Representatives. Uh, little did I know that I would end up retiring 50 years to the day from that first day I started working in the House of Representatives, and little did I know I would have such an active life in this community. I was born and raised in Seattle, went to Seattle Public Schools, University of Washington with a BA, and later an MPA, and uh, uh, so I've been here ever since, basically. So this photo, uh, it shows that I came, when I came here immediately upon graduation, I was a Ford Foundation legislative intern, an internship that lasted nearly a year, worked during the session and then later for an interim committee. This photo is of uh, we five interns, that session with Dr. Hugh Bone, the Dean of the Political Science Department at the University of Washington, who was the 
university uh, coordinator for the program and Representative Mary Ellen McCaffrey of the University District Area of Seattle was the legislative uh, coordinator for the side, for that side. The Ford Foundation sponsored this internship program here and in some other states as a means of encouraging state legislatures to become more co-equal with the executive branch. Their major strategy was to improve staffing. Back at the t that time, the legislature had hardly any staff. They had very little permanent staff, and there were only a few interim committees. So uh, the day after the session ended, the place really cleared out, I can assure you. But I was still there because I had this internship, so I got to see the place clear out. Um, so because the legislature had hardly any staff, the, the Ford Foundation interns were put in actual line positions, not intern positions with the legislature. I ended up being the sole staff person for the House Health and Welfare Committee. And this was typical. Most committees had only one staff person and uh, the, some of the larger committees had two. That was it. They didn't have their own attorneys and analysts and so forth. Um, and, my, and there was no training either, so, <laughs> so you just show up and start figuring it out. <laughs> so, uh, but my job as committee clerk included uh, maintaining, preparing and maintaining all records of the committee, including typing up amendments, keeping the records of the votes in committee, which back then occurred behind closed doors. I would type up amendments with a typewriter using carbon paper. <laughs> And it had to be perfect, no erasures, or the chief clerk's office wouldn't accept it. The chair was Jonathan Wetzel, an outstanding legislator from Seattle. The committee relied heavily on advice from state agencies since uh, they basically had no staff. And I'll give a little more legislative history shortly. So I moved here uh, directly from the dorms at the University of Washington. Uh, I drove an old car with no heater, with snow on the ground, and with all my worldly goods in it. And it's hard to imagine now, but I-5 was not completed. Yeah. So here's a photo of I-5 between Nisqually Delta and Mounts Road. Notice it's a four-lane, 35-mile-an-hour speed limit. And off kind of to the right, you see I-5 being constructed. And here are a couple more pictures of I-5 under construction across the Delta. You see a major, major project. Here's the second Nisqually Bridge going in. And here, the happy day when it was finished. This is what it looked like. I remember being thrilled. <laughs> and then here it is coming into the Capitol area. It was, it was really wonderful. So um, now I drove here, as I mentioned. If I had taken the train, which there's a railroad track, still is, between Seattle and here, I would have left from the venerable King Street Station in Seattle. And I would have arrived here in Olympia. <laughs> this was the train station in Olympia, a three-sided lean-to, and nobody I, I've talked to has ever seen it in that good a condition. <laughs> this must have been brand new. It was usually run down. I don't think anybody maintained it. There was graffiti. There was no paved walkway. It was just gravel and dirt to get there, gravel and dirt parking lot near it. So that was the welcome to the state capitol by train. So uh, my first order of business getting here on Friday before the session was check in with the intern coordinator and then uh, look for a temporary place to stay um, until I found you know, permanent lodging. So I went to the YWCA to, on Union Street to see if they were renting rooms because the motel seemed awfully expensive for a student budget. And the answer was no, they were full. And at that time, the YWCA rented rooms on a long-term basis to low-income women. But the woman who answered the door must have taken pity on me, dark, cold, standing there with my little suitcase. And she said that uh, I could spend a few nights on the overstuffed couch in the cavernous, unfinished basement of the building for $1.50 a night. I said, yes. <laughs> so that's where I spent my first weekend here in Olympia, and I was most grateful. So. Uh, so yeah, so here's where I, this is the YWCA back then. And, uh, and then here it is now, a nice difference in paint job, basically the same structure. 
So uh, Washington State, now a little more Washington State legislative history. Here's the opening of the session in 1967 in the Senate, all men. And uh, there were a few women in the House. It's quite changed now. And here is uh, the Senate during the session. Notice all the paper, and particularly I'd like you to note the bill books on the desks, the big stacks of books. These were ubiquitous. Every legislator, every day, had a complete set of bill books on their desk with all the bills current and all the amendments that have been proposed. And every day, you know, there were more. And the legislative process was very low tech. You know, there were no computers, no word processors, no faxes, no cell phones, no TVW, no internet. And so th the clerks from the bill room would spend all night pasting in the, um, putting the bills in and putting the um, amendments in. So uh, here's how they kept the bills in the book, basically with a big long shoestring that uh, they would put them in every day. And here, well, this didn't turn out very well, but here are uh, the amendment. The yellow is an amendment. And the amendments were on different size paper, depending on the size of the amendment. And then the bill clerks would paste them in all these, you know, 49 plus 99 books every day. So they did work through much of the night to do this. Very low tech. So, um, so anyway, so how did people find out about legislative hearings? You have an issue you care about? Well, the legislature did not print committee schedules. And like they do now, it's all online now. So as committee clerk, my job was to type up the, the uh, agenda, the announcement of the committee meeting for the next day or maybe the next couple days on a small orange form and then on a typewriter with carbon paper <laughs> and then tape them up on various marble pillars around the legislative building. So that was the low-tech way to do it. And um, the, this was not very good, of course. And so the Washington State Association of Counties, uh, as a public service, assigned their session intern to go around and talk to the committee clerks every day to find out what was going to happen the next day. He would go back to the office, type it up, mimeograph it, and leave stacks of announcements around the building. The same thing with status of bills. Any of you who follow the legislature, you know you have to know where a bill is in order to have input at the right, to the right people at the right time. So the legislature didn't produce any records on this either. So the precursor to Association of Washington Business, the Association of Washington Industries, assigned somebody to make telephone calls every day and try to figure out where the bills were. And they would type them up and reproduce them on ditto machines. and. Uh, and post them around the buildings. So, um, but this has all changed, and we should all be very proud that we have one of the best public information systems in the country for legislative information. You can go on, you can get vast, accurate, timely information on all the ways the legislature has improved. So back then, there were very few lobbyists, and the PDC, Public Disclosure Commission, was not yet established by Citizen Initiative. That was 1973. So there were no records of campaign contributions or who was lobbying who or spending how much money on that, et cetera. So, so here's the Capitol campus today. Uh, it's basically the same set of buildings, but who uses the space in the buildings has changed considerably. And I'd love to go into detail, but just the, the, the quick bottom line is 1967 was the first year legislators had their own offices. And so the legislature took over the two buildings to the south, the kind of identical looking buildings to the south of the legislative building to the fourth floor. So there were legislative offices and hearing rooms up there. And my desk was up there and with a loudspeaker blaring in the hallway so you could hear the, the uh, business going on on the floor. And gradually over time, the, the legislature and the governor have usurped basically all the state agency offices on the west side. And uh, uh, so it's now mostly legislature and governor policy people and, and <laughs> financial management people. So the, the reason for the expand, this was a period of major expansion in the legislative process. There, the state was going through a lot of transformational um, 
experiences and trends back there, at, back at that time. And so the legislative process was becoming busier, more issues, more complex issues. Legislature was hiring more staff. Agencies were hiring legislative liaisons, so that's where I came in. I did that for about a decade. And, and they needed more space. Now, with all the, the additional issues coming to the legislature starting in that period, they also needed more time. And uh, the Constitution at that time said, legislature shall be happen uh, 60 days every two years. Meantime, all these issues are happening, growing, populations growing, economies changing, and so forth. So the legislature went through, over about a decade, uh, a lot of different tries at getting more time. So first, so I have five things they tried before we got to what we have now. First, for many years, uh, the, in the even-numbered years, the governor would call a special session, and that became routine and got sort of established the practice of annual sessions. Um, only exception once Governor Dixie Lee Ray wouldn't do it. <laughs> so, uh, secondly, for many years following the now annual sessions, the governor would call a special session. So that got the legislature and the public used to having longer sessions. And uh, third, there were years when uh, the legislature started stopping the clock. I heard they would even put a black cloth over the clock. And I, I never saw it myself, but that would allow them, they thought, to keep working on bills after the constitutionally mandated end of the session. <laughs> Finally, they enacted a tax after midnight. Somebody took it to court, and the Supreme Court said, nope, can't do that. <laughs> No, uh, that's the session ends at midnight. So then the fourth thing they tried was they started having special sessions of unlimited duration. And uh, finally somebody took that to the Supreme Court and they said, nope, 30 days, that's the limit. So, so now that's what we have. And one year they experimented with kind of rolling sessions or continuing sessions or something like that where the legislature would come back uh, periodically throughout the year to try to work on issues. But I think the legislature found that unsatisfactory, so that wasn't continued. So now we have, uh, now later the, the voters, the legislature and the voters agreed on the system we have now. Uh, 105 days in the odd numbered year, 60 days in the even numbered year, special sessions of 30 days and so forth. So, uh, so that's a little bit of legislative history in a nutshell. Uh, lots more. <laughs> uh, so, uh, m moving on to local history, I uh, got a lot of data from Thurston Regional Planning Council, which I don't have time to share with you, but in summary, b since basically 1967 to now, uh, Thurston County has experienced about a 75% population increase. Uh, per capita income has grown faster than that. Uh, very interestingly, oh, and the racial mixture in our county has become way more racial and ethnic mixture, way more diverse. And interesting, the housing mix has changed. Back in 67, it was mostly uh, single family homes. Now about 50% of the building permits are for rental units being constructed. A huge change. So moving on to Olympia. Here's their logo. Um, Here's an aerial view of Olympia back then. Notice there is no East Capitol campus. Uh, it's a neighborhood sandwiched between a couple of state office buildings. There's no Swantown Marina, and I'll have more pictures of that. And notice around Capitol Lake, there are multiple rail lines with uh, boxcars uh, there. Here's the East Capitol campus under construction. So this was probably in the late 60s, early 70s. So the, the garage and the tunnel are under construction. You see the new Department of Transportation building in the background. That was Department of Highways at the time, and I did work in that building, and I watched brick by brick go in there on the plaza. The building in the front was, a, the brick one, was an apart, old apartment building. I also worked there. Uh, steam plants, steam <laughs> uh, things leaked and it was ready to go. And to the right of that had been the old Olympia High School. So here's what the East Capitol campus looks like today. Still some expansion. There's the new Jefferson Street building there in the background with lovely, now lovely landscaping. 
Um, so uh, Capitol Lake was, Heritage Park around Capitol Lake wasn't established, but Capitol Lake was there. And um, the, we had, um, let's see, this um, red and white roof restaurant there for decades. It was the big um, land, uh, landmark. And uh, thank you to the new owners who painted it a different color. Um, but the Capitol Lake was a very active uh, recreation area. You can see in the background there was were swimming uh, facilities. The coronation for the Lake Fair Court was always held there. Uh, there were power boats sometimes on the lake, and during Lake Fair there would be power boat races. And uh, there were sailboats on the lake. The city of Olympia Park Department sponsored a sailing club, and I actually taught sailing there for a while. That's a sketch my mother made once. So you can see there were lots of sailboats out there occasionally. There was a boathouse, a small boathouse, and a small dock. You can see the dock there she put in. So here's Olympia City Hall. And uh, the, the, the city leadership at the time, it was still pretty new when I got here. City leadership had wanted something creative. So this city hall is built in the round. The offices are circular, and there's a detached round city council chamber in the middle. Now I wanted to point out something that's really changed. Notice the grass around the city council chamber. When I arrived, that was water. It was a moat. And <laughs> And one day, yeah, one day I went down there and there were huge sturgeon in the moat. Yeah, had somebody in the front row remembers that too. Yeah, they were ugly and scary. <laughs> so Olympia has gone through uh, uh, three uh, governance changes since I've been here. It started out with a city commission, three members, one mayor separately elected. And then they went to council manager system with seven members, city council. Council selects one of its own to be mayor. And then uh, more recently, they made the mayor position separately elected by the citizens. So downtown Olympia has always been um, a central shopping, business, civic, and uh, cultural area. So here's some old pictures of Fourth Avenue. And there was a shopping center downtown, Seamart. Uh, down where, uh, down near where the Doubletree and Bud Bay Cafe are, that general area. So we're blessed by wonderful vistas in, in our area. Here's uh, Bud Inlet looking to the Olympic Mountains. I took that recently. But one thing that used to be in Bud Inlet that's no longer there, you couldn't see it, but you could hear it. And those were foghorns. And uh, there was a foghorn on the shoal, the shallow area near uh, um, the Olympia Golf and Country Club. And now how did the foghorn get turned on? Well, I had a friend who turned it on. And you know how she turned it on? Somehow, when it got really quiet in the early morning when the fog would form, she would wake up and flip a switch. That's how low tech it was back then. <laughs> yeah. And there used to be a foghorn at Boston Harbor, and then both of them are silenced now, but I think they are, should go on our list of historic sounds around here. And then, uh, so we, another wonderful vista is Mount Rainier, and occasionally we have spectacular sunrises. This is the shadow of Mount Rainier on the clouds when the sun's coming up behind it, which happens several times a year. So the port has always, the port and the port peninsula have always been front and center in our area. So here's a picture of approximately the time I came around. Notice there's no Swantown Marina. The docks are smaller. Um, so I got a couple more pictures of this from different sources. And there is, in the middle, there was a, a kind of a creosote plant that coated logs. And we're still doing environmental cleanup from that. And notice there's a little marina at the north end of the peninsula. And uh, that's where I kept the sailboat for a while. But that marina is, was taken away when the port expanded its dock. And at the very north end, you can see the Hakaranda restaurant, which was towed down here after the World's Fair in Seattle ended, 1962. It was the, like the home of the future. 
And so it was towed down here to become a restaurant after the fair. So here you can see the Hawker Ronda restaurant. There's the marina where I used to sail out of. And oh, I think, anyway. Oh, and notice, very importantly, the, where they're burning the sawdust. Those used to be very common in, um, uh, around Western Washington, but they don't qualify under current air pollution laws. So where are we now? Oh, here, oh, West Bay was also full of logs. Let's see. Oopsie. There. Yeah, this is um, the Delson area, the Smith Landing, and uh, a lot of, uh, lot of logging operation around here. And then out in Bud Bay, uh, near Gull Harbor, was the reserve fleet. And those were um, cargo ships from World War II that were, that were kind of being stored in case we ever needed them again. They took up a lot of space, as you can see. And uh, finally, uh, I guess the government decided they weren't needed anymore, so they were towed away for scrap. Here they are up close, sailing I saw. <laughs> so a lot of these, we'd sail right over to them and turn around. Um, what a lot of people might not remember is, I think for years on the charts, it still showed ship storage area. So you might recall the big international oil glut of many years ago. And there was a proposal that oil tankers that were not needed or couldn't be used during the global oil glut be stored here in Bud Inlet in this same place. So the Department of Natural Resources had a big public hearing. I went to it and everybody was very vigorously against it. Uh, only one person was for it, as I recall. So the Department of Natural Resources turned that down. But what a lot of people don't know is some years later, uh, a man wanted to use that same area to store used Russian freighter ships uh, and f store them there, fix them up, and sell them. Kind of like a used car lot. You'd bring the used cars in, <laughs> fix them up, and sell them. And uh, by that time, the environmental laws had changed, particularly shoreline management. And so the planning department uh, kind of told him this really wouldn't work. But so then, of course, he came. I was a senator by then. And he came in to see me with great complaints. And I tried to explain to him the history, but he was not really pleased about it. So anyway, so 1967, the year I came, of course, was a turning point for me. But it was also a turning point for our community. A lot of major things happened in 1967. First, the legislature authorized the creation, the establishment of the Evergreen State College. Huge impact in our area. So here it is under construction. And it, the legislature in 1967 also uh, uh, passed legislation is creating the community college system, which led to the creation of South Puget Sound Community College also, which has a huge impact on our area. Before that, we had the Olympia Vocational Technical Institute, and this, was, this is a picture from Fourth Avenue downtown. Another thing that happened in 1967 was the Timberland Regional Library System was established. It had been, uh, it had been a, um, a demonstration project, but it, it's a wonderful five-county regional library system. This is the old Carnegie Library that was the major library for the whole area until um, the Timberland Regional Library System was, uh, you know, full, uh, much more fully developed, and it's it's still growing and needs to grow. So, then th another thing that. Uh, happened in 1967 is the Thurston Regional Planning Council was established. It's been a major way for local governments in the area to coordinate on all the growth we're experiencing. So uh, 1967 was a really big year for this area. And then not too many years later, the um, Olympia Yashiro Sister City Association was created, which has, and Yashiro changed its name to Kato, but it's been a nice, um, uh, sort of cultural addition to our area and thousands of people in our area have been involved. So there are a couple of um, uh, tributes to our this relationship, the Yashiro Japanese Garden near the old Olympia City Hall and then the Fifth Avenue Bridge has been named uh, Yashiro Bridge by the Olympia City Council. So here I'd like to um, insert a note on 
community identity and engagement. Ever since I've lived here, I have noticed that there's been a very strong sense of community here and a strong tradition of community and civic involvement. And I think there are a couple things that have contributed to it that I'll mention today. One is our geography. We are somewhat separated from the growing megalopolis to the north by the Nisqually Delta and by the military bases, which used to be two bases, now it's one combined base. And the second is local media who have been very engaged in community life, not only reporting on it, but encouraging it. So here is the front page of the Sunday Olympian uh, the weekend I came here. Notice the Vietnam War is going on, talk about red China. Uh, and a couple days earlier, there had been an announcement that the, the basically what we call the Centralia coal-fired steam plant was going to be established. And I noticed on the Sunday paper, it says use of coal there is questioned. And that was an issue for many years. And now the plant's being phased out in part because of coal, and maybe other reasons too. It was fun to browse through the newspapers of the time. Newspaper price, Sunday edition, 10 cents. <laughs> there were employment ads for men's jobs and women's jobs. Um, chicken was 28 cents a pound. Coffee, 69 cents a pound. They, there was an ad for Kodachrome film. Anybody remember what that was? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a Chevy Impala went for $2,800. So. Oh, and some of the news articles put people's addresses in. I was shocked by that. <laughs> so uh, another major news media was KG, radio station KGY, and that's their building that's still there. And uh, they were an absolutely integral part of community life. And the stars of the show were Dick Poost and Bob McLeod. Uh, Dick had the morning show, got us all up with good information and, and good cheer. And he's on the left, and Bob McLeod is on the right. He was the news director, and he was famous for his Bob McLeod commentaries. He would patiently sit through sort of the endless local government hearings at night and then uh, summarize it and analyze it and give us a nice about three or four minute report in the morning, and we were all very well informed, and it, it, it contributed marvelously to uh, community life. So, moving on to Lacey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> former mayor here, John Halverson. <laughs> um, so, let's see. Lacey was uh, formed in December of 1966, one month before I arrived, so it was only one month old then. Uh, and the, uh, t a couple, I became a city council member appointed in, to a vacancy in 1973, and then a couple years later, the city council appointed me mayor. And I think the Olympian was so surprised that they gave me super top billing <laughs> 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 over, that's me, over, over a big legislative, uh, you know, um, scandal that was going on. So, uh, anyway, uh, so here is... First Lacey City Hall, it was a modular structure. And uh, later when the city bought property from St. Martin's to build the permanent city hall, this was moved to that site, used for a police station. And then after Lacey built on to the city hall to accommodate the police department, this was moved to Yelm, where I noticed one day it was the police department down there. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where it is now. <laughs> um, the, uh, the city council met in an old rundown building about a mile away, donated by the Lions Club, and we met using folding chairs and folding tables. So, and then adjacent to uh, the modular structure for City Hall was an old white house, which the police department initially used, and then later we moved that to a site donated by the Lacey Women's Club uh, to become a city museum. So then in 1979, we uh, uh, dedicated a new city hall at the site we're currently using. Uh, helping to cut the ribbon was Lenny Wilkins, a uh, famed, beloved manager of the Seattle Supersonics. They were training at St. Martin's at the time, so we invited him to come over and help with the festivities. So here's uh, some of the Lacey commercial area the time, the, what's now four lane roads were two lane roads back then. Uh, so this is Slater, Kinney, and Pacific in the middle. 
um, South Sound Shopping Center was just getting started. It had been established a year earlier uh, in 1966, I think, 65 or 66. There was a big outdoor theater there, drive-in theater, so that's what you see there on the left. And here's another shot of it. That's Fred Meyer is there now, that whole shopping center. So it was a big change when the theater went away. Uh, here's an aerial view of the area kind of east of the downtown area. You can see how low density it was. Um, that's Hicks Lake in the upper left. The, uh, notice there's an oval kind of in the upper middle. Uh, that was a very well, very popular race track, horse race track many years ago. Uh, the, they would race single horses with a little three-wheeled cart. And, and people would come by train uh, to watch the races. And there was a train station almost adjacent to the Oval. Um, and I understand from the Lacey Museum that Leopold Schmidt, founder of the brewery, at one time was a half owner of it. And the theory was he wanted to have access to the water rights. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway, this was the most, my first huge controversial land use decision to deal with when we had to rezone it for housing, and there was no way it could be saved for the open space the neighbors wanted, so that was my first really tough land use decision. So St. Martin's, it has always been, St. Martin's long precedes Lacey. Here it is, an old picture on the hill. And uh, it has grown substantially over the years. Here's a picture from 1965. You'll notice the sort of the gymnasium building. There's no conference center attached to it. The, the parking lot is unpaved with gravel and dirt and potholes. And some of the smaller buildings there on the left, one of them was a Quonset hut where St. Martin's had a nice performing arts theater. And I remember going to some performances there. So. Lacey had its own newspaper, the Lacey Leader. So that was a really nice way for, to help build uh, community uh, cohesion. And then Lacey went through a change in governance. The year I was appointed and I ran the first time, went from the mayor council form of government to the council manager form of government. Okay, moving on to Tumwater. Uh, one, of the, one of the oldest cities in the state. That was Tumwater City Hall when I l was here, and it was City Hall for a long time until the really nice new City Hall building was built. And then uh, Tumwater didn't go through any governance changes. It's the only area, only jurisdiction in northern Thurston County that hasn't either considered or done a governmental structure change. They have mayor council form. Oopsie. Oh, oh dear. This, was, this is the wrong. I have a picture of the brewery. Major, uh, it's on the other version of this, I'm so sorry, uh, but the, the Olympia Brewery was a huge economic base of Tumwater, and it, it uh, helped property owners with their property values. It was a huge source of jobs. The leadership of the brewery was very engaged in the community, provided wonderful civic leadership, and it was very sad that it was sold many years ago, and still sadder that it's been difficult to replace it. But they did leave a great legacy through the Olympia Tumwater Foundation, uh, through the um, Tumwater Falls Park, scholarships, the Schmidt House, and uh, the history programs they sponsor. So, and as famous as a brewery, and I had, I meant to show a different picture, but uh, was the Taiyi. And that was a big motel out uh, next stop on the freeway. And... Uh, that I have a, a picture of a headline from the Olympian saying something to the effect that uh, this is where kind of the informal part of the legislative process took place. <laughs> and it finally burned and uh, so, but if you were here back then, the, the Taiyi was a major activity in uh, the area. So moving on to Thurston County, uh, it's our logo that few of us established. This was the courthouse when I arrived. The top floor was the jail, and it was an old-fashioned jail with bars, so, and no air conditioning. And, uh, but with all the growth, the county had to <coughs> find more space, ultimately. And so, you know what they did? They bought the Capitol Center building. And, uh, uh, but it had been built a couple of years earlier with some local investors, 
and their thought was maybe put a bank on the bottom floor. But then, for some reason, they changed their mind. I remember all the headlines over this. It was quite the news. And they decided to build up on Mottman Hill, which we now called court, call Courthouse Hill. So they sold it to uh, Capital Savings and Loan, and then later it was used for state offices. So here's, uh, when I was sworn in as county commissioner, it was Woody Anderson, Karen Fraser, and George Barner. And uh, so we um, served well together. And then Thurston County, there's been a lot of talk about maybe should we change the governance structure of Thurston County. A freeholder pro it takes a freeholder process under our state constitution. So there were two county charter proposals that went on the ballot that the voters turned down. And then there was a county city charter proposal where that would allow uh, some merger of some county and city services, but that went down too, so. Oh, and logs were not limited to Bud Inlet. Um, uh, out at uh, Woodard Bay, part of the uh, south end of Henderson Inlet, the Chehalis Western Railroad twice a day brought train loads of logs, uh, huge quantities of logs down to Woodard Bay and they would be dumped into the water, put into log rafts and towed up to Everett. And, uh, but that's all gone now and the rail line has been converted to one of our major regional trails in the area and the dock uh, has been uh, separated from the land and it's now a nationally famous um, location for bats. They are nationally famous bats. I'm happy to talk more about that. So, but throughout my time around here, growth has been the hallmark of, of the counties, especially the county commissioner's uh, work. Uh, there's a lot you could say about all the different land use uh, battles and wars and achievements around here, but there are two history-making events in terms of land use that uh, were, went through Thurston County. One, there was a question way back, I think in the early 70s, can the county adopt a sub-area plan uh, without having adopted an entire county plan? So that was hotly fought. That came out of the Cooper Point area. There was a lot of concern about the growth stimulus of establishing a new college. So that went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled, yes, you can adopt a sub-area plan without having an entire county plan. So that's one piece of history. And then the other is, we were so engaged between the county and the cities in dealing with growth and figuring out how to do it that we came up with our own sort of innovative ways and some of those ways were incorporated into the new state's growth management act, for better or for worse, but anyway. Uh, so, and then when I moved here, there was an epic battle, political battle going on for the future of the Nisqually Delta. There were some people who wanted to industrialize it, make it a, a deep water port, and others wanted to preserve it for conservation and wildlife. And so, this is one of the favorite posters from uh, that battle and uh, on the conservation side, of course, and ultimately the conservation side won. But you know, it's also turned out to be a major tourist attraction too. So uh, anyway, that's a, that was going on and somebody should write a book about the history of, of, of the Nisqually Delta. Tribes, just a quick on tribes. When I first came here, you never really heard much about tribes. And, uh, but that has, uh, and tribal governments and tribal communities, but that has really changed over the decades. And we have three basically tribal communities that this area interacts with. The Squaxin Island Tribe, the Nisqually Tribe, and the Chehalis Tribe. And so here's just a couple of quick pictures uh, relating to each of them. Here's, up on the upper left is uh, the paddle, Nisqually's paddle to Nisqually. The tribes from all the way up and maybe even Alaska paddled down here is quite an, quite an event. And they, they paddled, they, they came to Olympia and then of course went down the Nisqually uh, Reservation. And the Squaxins have uh, sponsored a paddle to Squaxin too. To the right is the very fabulous uh, Squaxin Island Tribe Museum. Recommend you all go there. And then at the bottom, a uh, representation of the Chehalis tribe that have been very involved in, in community life and uh, do a really nice job of, uh, of uh, sponsoring uh, traditional arts. So here is our area today. 
And uh, many seeds of time have flourished, and we are all the fortunate beneficiaries. Seeds continue to be planted all around us. Which ones are going to grow? Well, we're each part of that. We're each part of our future. So um, I'd just like to say thank you to a variety of people who helped me pull together pictures and information for this. State Archives, Lacey Museum, State Library, uh, John Hughes, who's here sec with the Secretary of State's office, uh, um, the Thurston Regional Planning Council, Olympia Historical Society, Port of Olympia, Olympia YWCA, Dick Poost, who gave me the KGY picture, uh, Sarah Smythe McIntosh, and Harold Wolf Sr. So uh, thank you very much. Love to answer questions. I'm sure there must be some uh, questions or comments for Karen, and we do have some time left if you'd like to uh, raise your hand and, and, and maybe share a memory or ask a question of Senator Frazier. Anybody know anyone who does not like Ken Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you. John? I just want to thank you for launching my career <laughs> in 1974. John Halverson, uh, former mayor of Lacey, and the prior person was Mark Fouch, former mayor of Olympia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> In 1974, I was a new resident, two years in Lacey, and for some reason, somebody mentioned me to you, and you appointed me at my very first Citizen Advisory Committee. It was for the Department of Transportation, and we, on that committee, were supposed to advise whether there should or should not be a northbound exit to Slater County. Oh, I remember that, yes. <laughs> and so thank you. And then, of course, I just got involved in a whole bunch of Lacey Committee representations many, many years' worth and eventually got appointed to the council. So I well, thank you for that. Thank you. I was always looking for good people to appoint, and you were clearly one of them. <laughs> I did have another question. I saw that headline in the Olympian, and it has, you know, Ms. Lacey, or whatever Ms. said there. Lacey yeah. takes a Ms. Mayor. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering, is there any relation to the immediate to the right, right below, where it says the mental hospital security system? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your experience as a woman first running for public office. Well, the question is, experiences of being a woman running for public office when I first got into it. At when I was first appointed to, when I first was elected mayor of Lacey, that's when I started having my more interesting experiences. Um, a lot, of, there, there were basically no women mayors. And so at first I was a curiosity. Um, people would ask me, what's it like to be a woman mayor? Well, how am I supposed to answer that? I've never been a man mayor. <laughs> So, you know, a mayor is a mayor, a mayor, really. Uh, but I was very aware that I was a role model because it was so unusual to have a woman mayor. And back then, uh, attitudes were, were more stereotyped. And so I had to always be on my toes because if I slipped, then it would, it would reflect on all the other women and the girls. And so I was always very careful about that. And then times, times have changed. But when I ran for county commissioner, I remember, I was the second woman county commissioner, Marge Young was the first. Remember there was a question, well, what does a woman know about roads? <laughs> well, you know, I, well, no, I had worked for the state highway department. I had been their legislative, assistant legislative liaison. I had been on the citizens transportation advisory committee around here. I made road decisions for the city. I mean, really. <laughs> so, but when I got to the legislature, it was quite different. There were quite a few women there by then. How about in the back? What's a one seed for the future that you could share with us that you wish to flourish? The best seed I think we could have is uh, uh, an end to violence in all walks of life. Personal, political, social, cultural, yeah. That would be my number one wish, yeah. Just a follow-up, can you see something in the county or, or city governments that can change that? 
Well, I think all the governments are working toward this. And, and, but it, you know, it really, for social cultural change, it takes the citizenry. Look, the governments follow the citizens. So everything everybody does counts. And so I encourage everybody. What do you think were some of the most important legislative uh, actions that you were able to take? Question, what most important legislative actions? Uh, well, one of the bills I'm most proud of for my entire career I got passed when I was in the House, and that was the uh, f uh, creation of the sis statewide system for enhanced 911. Back then, uh, when you dialed, in most areas of the state, when you dialed 911, you would have to say, oh, well, my address is, you know, here's what's going on, and then the call operator would have to figure out, you know, who to dispatch. With enhanced 911, which is what we're so used to now, uh, you have a computer system that when you call, uh, even if you don't say a word, the call center knows where you are, and they will send somebody even if you can't talk. You might be afraid to talk because there's a burglar in the house. You, it might be a child who can't explain things, uh, or it might be you've had a stroke and you're not really able to talk. So it took, it took a, a small telephone tax statewide to fund this and to help especially the more rural counties be able to afford uh, this this communication system and so now it's normal and they everybody's house is programmed so they know which medic van to send and which fire truck etc so I'm really proud of that another thing I worked on I played I chaired the capital budget but I was also on the capital budget committees for you know most of my tenure in the legislature and expansion of the capital campus all that investment and uh, the investment out at, for new bu buildings out at the Evergreen State College, investment for the buildings at South Puget Sound Community College. When I first came here, South Puget Sound Community College was all kind of trailers. Yeah, it was all modular structures and they weren't that great. And so now it looks like a regular campus because we put so much investment into it. So those are some of the things and there's vastly more. You've been a lady mayor. You've been a lady. Uh, have you ever thought about breaking a record and being the second governor, lady governor of the state of Washington? <laughs> yeah. what, what, what about being governor? Well, I'd say thank you for the compliment. Yeah. <laughs> you compliment her. <laughs> so let's see. Is anybody not asked a question who wants to before we go to round two here? The, you talked about the 911. With so many people going to cell phones now, how does that affect that? Oh, yes. We had the legislature, I just talked about the foundation of it. Actually, to go back to the foundation, so I was in the House at the time, and the Senate Ways and Means Committee would not agree to enact this small telephone tax statewide. And so they said, we'll only move the bill if you will agree to put it on the ballot as a referendum. So then we had to run a statewide campaign to get the voters to vote for this. Of course, they voted overwhelmingly, but it seemed to me that, you know, for something as life-saving as this, you shouldn't have to do that, but we did. So then as telephone technology has evolved, the, the way the taxation works has evolved too. So it, the, the getting money for the system and uh, being able to find people, you know, with cell towers and so forth. It, it's evolved technologically and financially as the technology has grown. So every few years there's been a bill to upgrade this. Uh, John? Yeah, I know you were the first, so maybe there aren't too many, but could, could you say if you had any mentors and who they might have been when you first began? Why, uh, they were, early, early years they were all men, of course. And so there have been some wonderful men in my life who have encouraged me and helped me, and I'm uh, fully grateful. Yes, and I haven't, I didn't get any permission to give names, so. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's it's true. Some wonderful men who've uh, uh, helped me have opportunity and to do my thing and to have new opportunities. Yeah. 
Again, thank you, Karen, for being willing to talk to me. I think we have a presentation to oh, you. Oh, oh, okay. For you. A lot of these photos up here, like that one, the, the, the governor was killed on that Nisqually Bridge that we had. There's so many things that, you, that she has. The ship's down here. We cut them up down here in Olympia. I was, oh. a, I was a foreman on the, I just got out of the Navy about that day. They grabbed me and put me on a burner cutting them up. Uh, you know, one thing that like, I like to see is a little niche here to put our, uh, these little historians' ashes in a, in an hourglass so they can keep us busy. <laughs> Turn it every once in a while. But anyway, for your I've got an hourglass figure. Is that <laughs> this is another photo that I discovered at an old fellow. It was hidden away and he's had his legs chopped off from, he was a veteran and everything who I helped. And we'd like to give this small token. That's a capital with a light. All right, thank you so much. Lightning that's been around here. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't there. <laughs> you can buy these probably in the gift shop. Uh, oh. the capital, hopefully. Oh. Uh, they, we're working on it now, to, uh, but they all have a price they sell. Big. You can also buy my medallion I designed up there. It's a, a silver one for the state secretary, and they sell them for $107. That's <laughs> silver in that one. So thank you very much. That, you just reminded me that we want to thank everybody for your generous donations to the Olympia Tumwater Foundation and our history program. And that's uh, one of the things that we've gone with high tech here is the what we call a dip jar. And I've, I know some people have already used that. Put your credit card in and automatically you've donated $5. And that little noise that you heard out there is from the dip jar being used. And so we're getting high tech, not just the... Uh, the uh, clear glass box that you put your donations in. But thank you so much for doing that. And also thank you for filling out those surveys and to make sure you take a pin with you. Uh, we, we are expanding our program and, uh, and we're ex excited to get your input as to what you would like to see happen in the historic district and Henderson House and with Crosby House and the historic park down below along with what we're already doing up here. So thank you for that input. We uh, really appreciate that. And let's see, did I forget anything? I think, oh, well. Next time, yes, next time is, uh, what, May 17th, and we have an actor will be set up a little different, no microphones and big screens. It's an actor portraying Leopold Schmidt, and you're going to have a visit with Leopold as, he, as uh, Christ, uh, Christopher Valcho will be the actor, and he will come in in character and uh, share his life, and, and uh, it's going to be unique. So that's May 17th, or, yeah, May 17th on Thursday right here at the Schmidt House. So thank you for, for asking that, too. And thank you for coming, and we are dismissed. But don't forget there's a little framed thing of that, the uh, newspaper article about Karen Frazier where she was Ms. Mayor over on the buffet.